Monica, I thought you would uh, stay up here since uh, Tim said you would go ahead and preach, but I, I saw you exit pretty quick at that point, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you a little bit more notice the next time in doing that, but thank you for sharing this morning. Well, how are you doing on your Lenten journey? Have you found uh, something that uh, has caught your attention for a moment uh, uh, to remind you of God's love and God's grace that uh, would make you take a, a little bit closer look at our lives and our hearts so that we might understand the grace of God? So that we might understand the grace of God and find uh, a closer walk with him as we move towards Easter. One of the things that um, has uh, been spoken of a number of times, and I can't remember uh, doing this, which has been meaningful in my reading, but I don't know that I've preached, uh, is to look at the last words or last statements of Jesus. Uh, there are seven of them that are a part of that, and if you count the weeks and the days between now and Easter, You'll say, preacher, you don't have enough Sundays. Well, I'm going to use Holy Week for one of them uh, as a part of that time. But, uh, but these are things that, that to me, state something of, of the significance of Jesus' life and, again, his love for us. There's a book that was written uh, a few years back uh, that's entitled All the Last Words of Saints and Sinners. And the words of persons before they breathe their last that uh, were spoken. Uh, there are some that I read from uh, some of those uh, uh, figures we see in the uh, uh, normal world, I guess, uh, that were crazy little things which uh, had no significance, no meaning as far as what related to a, a person's faith journey. But in this book, it says that Many times the things that are said are words that we should uh, pay close attention to and they should give us concern for what was said. Maybe for you, you've experienced those times. I've been there a few times in my journey of ministry when persons have spoken their last. Sometimes those words have expressed a need. They've expressed a need of something uh, maybe very weakly spoken by that person uh, to say, can you, can you move my pillow? Can you, you know, put a pillow behind my back? Sometimes it may have been, can I have a drink of water? And other times it's been a, a concern. And at times we're usually the ones who speak these words to our loved ones, but sometimes they say to us, it's going to be okay. And they're the one. one that we probably hold dearest to our heart is when our loved one says to us, maybe in their final breath, I want you to know I love you. Wesley was to have been quoted as saying at his last breath, best of all, God is with us. Best of all, God is with us. Those words uh, that Jesus spoke, again, we heard in the scripture today that, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't know, but maybe in your Bible, but if you'll look down, and it's in my Bible, and I just followed at that point, verse 34 was not in the original text of Luke's writing of the gospel. These words, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, was not included. Why? Well, at times, um, Luke uh, wrote from uh, that more of a historian than anything else. And the one thing that he would do is that he would talk and interview persons who had been eyewitnesses to a part of Jesus' life or that they had experienced uh, something under his ministry. And so he began to write as a part of that. It's thought that uh, those early persons, as they looked at these words, that maybe this was something because Luke had not run across someone who was an eyewitness close enough to Jesus to hear him speak these words. But the scriptures were circulated, and as they made their circulation around from city to city, 
they came upon a city, the story was told, a city where there happened to be one who was an eyewitness to the events of the crucifixion. He heard the reading of the scripture and everyone knew that he had been there, but he said to Luke and to others there, there's something that Jesus said. There's something that Jesus said from the cross that's too important to not have written down. And the story was told. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Scripture says it was Simon of Cyrene that carried the cross of Jesus. Those who studied a little bit more after that realized that Simon of Cyrene had two sons, Alexander and Rufus, who were no doubt with him. Simon was pulled from the side along the streets as Jesus made his way uh, to Golgotha. He fell under the weight of the cross, and they pulled Simon out. And here are his two sons with him. I'm sure with their father carrying the cross for Jesus and then not understanding fully what Jesus was about to experience, those two boys, fearful for their life, made sure that they did not lose sight of their father. And it's thought that possibly Rufus is the one who said, this is what Jesus said. Rufus later on is quoted and is mentioned a couple of times in the scripture in a part of he may have been a very strong, committed Christian follower. But I don't know about you, but as a, as a young boy or as a young girl, there have been things that, that had had an indelible mark on your life. You would remember them. And Rufus said, this is too important not to be shared. Would you agree? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. A couple of things that are part of these words. One is that we need to remember that uh, Jesus uh, was not praying for himself, but he made connection with his heavenly father. And as I thought about this, and, and I heard a, a couple of folks sharing instances with me uh, over the past week of things that are difficult and saying, why, why, why is something not happening? We're praying for so-and-so, and it just seems like it's one thing after another, and it just gets more difficult and difficult. And, and where's God? God's not hearing our prayers, and I'm beginning to get angry. Folks, if there would have been any anger, do you not think Jesus would have had a right? And instead of praying for himself, what did he do? He connected with the Father. It's a reminder for you and for me that no matter how great, the trials and the difficulties of our life are, we need to have that connection with our Heavenly Father. It was that sense that Jesus knew that he could turn to him. He could turn to him because they had been on a, on a regular conversation basis through prayer over and over again. That had been the practice of Jesus' life. So when he faced one of the most difficult things of his life, he turned to the Father in prayer. Can we do the same? Someone I was having that conversation with asked that question, and then it was a part of like rushing through the day and say, why is it, you know, I just take off and go do something, and I'll, then I'll think, well, maybe I should have began with prayer. Have you ever done that? We all have. Not only in difficult situations, but sometimes because of the busyness of our day, that we've not even stopped for a moment just to say a prayer that begins the day. We may not be able to take a long time, but to have a connection with the Father as we begin our day in prayer. The other question you might be asking as a part of that was, for whom was Jesus praying? Well, we could have stopped in reading Scripture in verse 34 as a part of that, but you would have missed out on who was there around the cross. Who was there? Well, there were the soldiers who were cruelly torturing Jesus as he made his way. They were shouting out words at him. They were the ones who actually were the hands-on persons to, to crucify him. And they were even gambling for his garments as a part of that. That sense of uh, demeaning acts of things that were happening. There was also the crowd. They were 
throwing their insults toward them. They were mocking him in a part of that. There were also the religious leaders who some were close by, but others were hidden because of their own jealousy and spiritual blindness. They had conspired with the Romans to crucify Jesus. Such mercy in the life of Jesus Christ calling upon the mercy of God to forgive. But there's somebody else. Somebody else included in that prayer. Jesus was pleading from the cross for God's mercy to be extended even to us. Do you remember the hymn? Were you there? We all were there. Maybe not in the physical sense, but Jesus was offering that prayer, prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And yet, how many times in our life have we uh, been those who have not done what we need to do as a part of our life? Sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes knowing it's a willful act of things that we share in our lives. The thing is that... uh, He was praying for all those undeserving. Did the soldiers deserve to be remembered in prayer? For the mercy of God to be shown to them? Did the crowd, did the religious leaders do these? It was for all those undeserving and all of us are in that camp. There are none of us that are deserving as a part of that. No one deserved the petition that Jesus offered that day. It's a reminder to us that sometimes... Sometimes we think uh, that uh, we are those deserving and there are others that are undeserving as the object of God's love. But does not the scripture say, for God so loved the world? Not just us. Sometimes we forget the extent of God's love and God's grace and it goes far beyond us. Sometimes if we're not careful, and you've probably heard me say this, we can have the mindset, lest we become so self-righteous that we think that we're special. God loves all of us. And none of us are deserving of his grace and his mercy. But there are two major themes that are a part of the scripture. You know this. It's our need for forgiveness and God's willingness to forgive. Our need for forgiveness and God's willingness to forgive. Because Jesus is trying to tell us something. We are in need of forgiveness. We need to be forgiven. It's a part of our lives when we recognize that we share that we are those who struggle with sin in our life. In today's world, we give it a more sophisticated name as a part of that. But the Greek and the Hebrew translation of the word sin has two meanings as a part of that. One is to stray from the path and the other is to miss the mark. To stray from the path or to miss the mark. God has a path, a way intended for us to live, but we don't always follow. Lent is a time for us to begin to to look at that. It's a part of our recognizing that that sin is something, again, that, that we may at times take lightly or we use different language in the midst of that. But the church traditionally has talked about seven deadly sins. Where's Richard? Sorry, it's hiding back there. Richard is, is doing a class at this particular time. But I really wonder, do we, do we even remember what they are? Struggle. It's a part of our life. Those in Richard's class probably would because they've been reminded recently. But but just for us to look, it's lust, gluttony, greed, sloth. Somebody said, what is a sloth? Well, you may know. But it's being lazy, apathetic, or neglecting something we know we need to do. Wrath, envy, or pride. And I ask myself the question and let you listen in. How are you doing with these?
because these sins promise pleasure and happiness, but ultimately lead to pain and to death. Sin is a part of our lives, and you and I can probably recognize, but on a global scale, if we look, sin is perhaps at the heart of cruelty in humanity, and hatred is a part of that, and it's behind much of the suffering in the world. Sin. Some have said Christians and churches uh, spend too much time talking about sin. Um, we'll take a moment to catch on that. And I think some do. I think some do spend too much time talking about sin. Because at the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel is God's grace and mercy. You cannot appreciate. You cannot appreciate God's mercy until you know you need it. Isn't that right? There are people who at times just say, well, you know, how can you live life if you've heard the message of the gospel? How can you turn away from being a follower of Christ? You can never go back to a place of where you can say, I never heard that before. Sin is a part of it, and, and sin, yes, is, is one of those things that separates us from God and separates us from each other, but we also know that Jesus came and he spoke those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God gave us a remedy to sin, and yet we need to live that out in our lives in such a way so that we know that we are forgiven. And if there's anything that separates us from God or separates us from someone else, then we need to take care of it because we know the answer to come. And with hearts that are broken, to ask God to make it right, to forgive us. Jesus asked the Father to forgive because inside of us, sometimes there continues to be those things that we do which are not God's will, and sin will forever be a part of the world that you and I live in. Charles Spurgeon once said these words, If there is no other description of Jesus than this text alone, it should convey us of the truth of his deity. It should invoke our adoration and our worship with us for a Savior who asks the Father to forgive sin. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As children, we grow up. Our parents are constantly telling us. Now, you all have heard these words. Don't do that. It was usually because it was probably something wrong or harmful or could harm us. We didn't have to be taught how to be bad or to do the wrong things, did we? We had to be taught to do right and to do the good things. And as we grow older again, sometimes it's a part of it that uh, we just find more clever ways to justify our actions. But is sin being a problem? Sin is the diagnosis. But what's the cure? The cure is that it's God's grace that he offers us the gift of salvation. He reminds us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's heart surgery by the divine physician. It's not just something that happens completely at one time. It's a continuing monitoring of our hearts and our lives to see if we are those who are examining and allowing God to be God and Christ to be Lord and Savior of our lives, not just our Savior, but to be Lord of our lives. Again, because that grace is a gift. What makes it so remarkable is despite all that was going on around Jesus, he prayed for us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you've looked any at all as to a part of what happens to the physical anatomy and 
crucifixion, you'll know that there's a, a strain and as with the weight that is there, the lungs are stretched to their limits in the midst of that and Jesus' feet being there with the nails holding him against that cross in the midst had to force himself to the best of his ability, his full weight to raise just a little bit to be able to even get enough air to say anything at all. And yet, he asks nothing for himself. At least not here. His first words were, Father, in these moments, one of the most difficult moments that you and I will never experience as a part of our lives, he turned again his heart to the Father and said, Forgive them. All of them. Those around the cross. Those that will be born as a part of this world somewhere in the distant future. Forgive them. Because he offers us the gift of grace. A gift of grace not earned, not deserved call upon him and to live our life. Our sin is no small thing because the Son of God was crucified for us. And God has already done everything necessary to save us and forgive us. What God's grace did was to save us from ourselves and our sin. Our task is to accept the gift of grace. Is there a need? For forgiveness in your life today? We have an opportunity. God invites us to come. To be those who are gathered together. The Coventry Church in England. After the bombing during the war. The church was pretty much destroyed. They decided that they wanted to rebuild. They didn't tear the remainder of the old church down. They built the new church by the side. But the entrance into the church led its way with the walls still there. It led the place which could either be called the communion rail or the altar rail. And on that rail, at that rail, they took timbers, charred and broken in some ways, and they shaped a cross. And they placed on that cross these words. Father, forgive them. Every time we see an old rugged cross, the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But we know that God offers us grace, a gift, a gift to know him and to be cleansed and made whole and made complete. A hymn that we share the song at this point is, Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, that says, I will arise and go to Jesus. Where else could we go? if we need forgiveness than to the one who offers it, who's already paid the price for us to have life and have it abundantly. Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, by your spirit, take these words this day that come from Holy Scripture Words so important that they must be shared. That Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, we continue to be those who are poor and needy because there is a bent to sin that remains nearby in all of us. And we must look closely at our hearts and of our lives and to know that we can find forgiveness again at the foot of the cross. Do what you would do 
stir our hearts, our spirits to be those who can know this day we've heard the word. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.